Hey everybody, it's great to be with you online. I'll tell you a quick story. About this time last year, something really strange happened to me. See if you identify with this. So I don't remember, I was watching a football game or a basketball game, I don't remember what it was, and one of my little kids in the house had gotten some candy from a school function or something, and there was some blow pops. Y'all know the blow pops? I should have brought one with me today. I don't know where you're tuning in from, but they're little suckers that have the hard candy shell on the outside and then the chewing gum on the inside. And I don't know how I got my hands on it, but as dads do, I stole the candy from my kids and I started chewing on that thing and I had like a flashback to my childhood. I hadn't had a blow pop in years. I thought, this is just amazing. And then I went and got another one from them and stole another piece of candy and began to eat it. And then I had this really strange thing. See if you have ever had this happen in your adult life. It dawned on me, wait, I'm, I'm like a grown man. I, I can eat these blow pops anytime that I want because I was having flashbacks to when I was a kid when my parents, and rightly so, as moms and dads do, they would limit my sugar intake. I couldn't just eat random things whenever I wanted. I might not eat my supper or might hurt my teeth. And I had this moment where I thought, wait, I, I can eat all the blow pops that I want to. And so I got online to a, one of the shopping places online on the app, and I found out you can buy bulk blow pops. Did you know this? It's fascinating. You can buy like 50, 100 packs of blow pops. So without asking my wife, it's easier to get forgiveness and permission in a married relationship. Don't quote me on that. I ordered a huge bag of blow pops, and a couple days later, they come in. And then that next Saturday, I'm watching the game again, and I pull them out, and I'm so excited. So I start eating these blow pops, and I'm just crunching on them. I'm not sucking on them down to the, to the gum. I'm eating these blow pops like a madman. And one turned into two, and two turned into four. I'm not joking, four turns into eight, and by halftime or whatever it was of the game I was watching, I look over on the little table beside me and there is a mound of sticks and wrappers where I don't know how many of these things I've eaten. And there was a moment, not of shame, but of pride. I'm like, I'm a grown man. I can eat all the blow pops that I want to and nobody can tell me otherwise. And that turned into this vicious cycle where I was just eating blow pops for months. It became a whole joke and a thing in my small group here at Northway where my wife was saying, you're not going to believe what this guy's doing. And then my wife began to say, baby, you probably shouldn't eat this many blow pops. I don't know the medical side effects of this. That's probably way too much sugar. And I'm not kidding. I went for a couple months ordering bulk bags of blow pops. Do you all know what the term blind eye means? I, I looked it up so I could actually give you kind of a real definition of it. It's to ignore something that you know is wrong. Here's another definition, to intentionally not give someone or something any attention. So like, I turned a blind eye to all rationality that I probably shouldn't be eating 12 to 14 blow pops a day. Yes, I had a problem, so that you're not worried and you're not calling the officials of our church to turn me in. I'm not doing that anymore, I learned my lesson. But I turned a blind eye to all that I knew was probably right with health consequences. And I thought, who cares? I'm not going to worry about that. And I just chose to ignore it. And then here's where we land today with our sermon. Because when I was writing through this and the topic that I'll share with you in just a second, that blow pop story kind of came back, as odd as that may sound. So stick with me. I began to realize that sadly and not quite as funny more times than not, I turned a blind eye to my friends and my neighbors and my family that are lost and don't have the hope in Jesus. Like it's obvious, it's right there in front of me, but maybe because of fear or anxiety or what I project on them that they may say, I just turn that blind eye to rationality that they need hope, just like I turned a blind eye to the health consequences of eating all those blow pops. And that may kind of sound silly, but that's the way my mind works. And I just wonder if you're like that today. If you are a Christ follower, maybe you're tuning in today and you call Northway your home, or maybe you're tuning in and you are a part of a church somewhere around the world. Maybe you would say, Paul, I'm the same way. I, I know that the folks in my life need Jesus, but boy, I'm 
you're right. I, I turn a blind eye to that and pretend like it's not even there. Pretend like there's not even consequences that if they were to die, that they would spend an eternity in hell. But yet I have that hope, and I'm just turning a blind eye to them. I would say that for me, and if I may, for the majority of, quote, the big C church, we've just lost a passion that we once had for evangelizing people. And I know evangelism is sort of a churchy word, but the bottom line is, the way I would put it, is that it's just sharing the hope of Jesus with people. We say that we have found hope in Jesus, and so it's God's plan A, that we would go to the people in our radius, the people that we come in contact with, and we would also share that hope that we would tell them that Jesus Christ died for us and the hope that we now have in finding him. That's simply what evangelism is. And I think we've lost the passion we once had for winning people to Jesus. I call it blind eye evangelism. When we turn our attention to everything else under the sun, maybe even a lot of good Christian type things, Christian activities, but we neglect the primary mandate on our lives of sharing the gospel with people. The gospel being the hope of Jesus, that he died on the cross to give us hope, to give us an eternity in heaven with God. So if you'll come in a little closer and join me, I want to take a look at a story about the greatest witness for Christ who's ever lived. He's a guy named the Apostle Paul. And I think we can gain some confidence, we can restore some hope, and we can begin to become effective evangelists. Effective, once again, of telling our friends, the people in our radius, about Jesus. Now, I want to read this entire chapter. It's actually not real, real long, but if you'll follow along with me, maybe in your Bible, wherever you are, on an app, or I believe it'll be on the screen for you today. It's in Acts chapter 18, starting in verse 1, and I'll try to narrate and help you understand what's going on because it can get a bit wordy. There's a lot of content packed into this. Listen to what it says. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them because he was of the same trade and he stayed with them and he worked for they were tent makers by trade and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So we're introduced to this husband and wife, Priscilla and Aquila, who were by trade tent makers and we learn that the apostle Paul was also a tent maker to support his ministry. So he finds this family and he goes in and begins to work with them and begins to develop a relationship. We pick up the story in verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Macedonia, so Silas and Timothy are just sort of mentees of the Apostle Paul, if you will. Paul was occupied with the word. He was testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and he said, get this, he said, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. What does he mean? Jesus was a Jew. The gospel was for the Jewish people at this time. And the apostle Paul says, you're not listening. You don't want to hear that the Messiah has come and it is Jesus. So I'm going to all the other races and cultures to give them a chance to know who this Jesus is. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus. He was a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, also believed in the Lord, together with his whole household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Don't be afraid, but go on speaking and don't be silent, for I'm with you. And no one's going to attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But here the story turns. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achai, the Jews made a unified attack on Paul and brought Paul before the tribunal. So, uh uh-oh, Paul's in trouble. They're bringing a religious argument before the political figure. And they said, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to our law. But when Paul stood and was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, this is the official, the government political official, he interrupts before Paul can speak and he says, listen, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or some vicious crime, O Jews, 
I would have reason to accept your complaint, but since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge over this stuff. And he drove them from the court. He drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized this guy named Sosthenes, who was the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to this. Now, I know what you're thinking. All right, Paul, blow pops, blind eye. I see what you did there, kind of funny, blind eye evangelism. But if you're trying to encourage me to be more proactive in sharing my faith, why would you share this story? I mean, we've got church hurt, we've got fights, we've got pettiness, we've got politics in here. There's even physical violence when people were trying to tell people about Jesus. Yeah, Paul, I'm really going to go out and tell my neighbors about Jesus as a result of that story. And I get it, I get it. But what if we read this and looked at what God is doing behind the scenes? See, God never changes. And so the same God that is moving and shaping these lives and is empowering the Apostle Paul and changing lives in this narrative and throughout history is the same God that we serve today, the same God who has saved us through Jesus Christ, the same God that will be with us when we go out to share our faith. Did you see how the Holy Spirit guided the Apostle Paul? The Holy Spirit will guide you. The Apostle Paul had to have thought, why Corinth? It can't happen here. This doesn't make sense. These people won't listen. In fact, Corinth's reputation was known all over the Roman Empire. It was a very strategic trade location, lots of ins and outs, and people coming and going had a very unsettled population, and it was very debaucherous during the time. In fact, it would have been a pretty good place for a church plant, but it would have been really difficult to make that happen during this time. However, the Holy Spirit was Paul's guide. And he came to Corinth determined to magnify the resurrected Jesus Christ above everybody. I read this funny little story about two boys who approached a man shoveling snow from his driveway one day. And they asked, hey, can I shovel your snow, mister? To which the man obviously replied, can't you see I'm doing it myself? The little boy replied, sure. That's why we ask. We get most of our business from people who are half through and just feel like quitting. <laughs> we live here in Pittsburgh where we're... Uh, recording this today, and so I'm dreading the winter. I know what this, these little boys are talking about, shoveling that snow. I just want to quit halfway through. I bet Paul felt like quitting at the beginning of this story. They're not listening. They're not hearing. It's a debaucherous city. I'm ready to move on, but he knew that the Spirit of God had called him there, and it's time that we stop asking God why and start telling God, okay, I'll do it, even if it defies my logic. We as Christ followers use excuse after excuse to keep from doing what God has called us to do in our personal and our corporate lives as a church. When God opens doors, the enemy will absolutely try to close them. But if we persevere in his power, God will bless. The Holy Spirit of God will guide you and will empower you. But did you see what else God did behind the scenes? how he blessed the obedient perseverance and then brought about the blessing and the answers. You know, it's been said the devil never kicks a dead horse, right? Whenever God is blessing a ministry, you can expect increased opposition as well as increased opportunities. When it looked as if nothing was going to come of this city, a prominent leader in the Jewish community was saved. A prominent leader in the Jewish community turns his life to Jesus. Can you imagine the shock waves that this sent through the Jewish community and through Corinth at that time? Verse 8 says, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Friends, the lost, those who do not know Jesus, have to hear it from somebody. I tell our folks at the campus that I have the privilege to pastor here at Northway over in Dormont, Pennsylvania, often that there is no plan B. There's no second wave coming in to save everyone. When we invite Jesus into our life, we are to grow and as a disciple. But he's given us the great commission in Matthew where we are to go out and to share that love with other people. Somebody has to speak. Someone has to tell them. It's easy to say, well, you know, they've already heard it or they know who Jesus is. If you think that, then you're culturally ignorant. I run into people every day who don't know who Jesus is 
who don't know the story of the gospel. It's mixed up in a lot of cultural religiosity, and they don't know the true Jesus. Just this past week or so, I encountered this where I was sitting with a banker and opening an account at a, at a new institution and began to talk with this gentleman and he was, you know, doing the banker thing and asking me about my family and such. And so I sort of turned the tables on him and how's your family? And he talked about that um, his daughter had been to the Taylor Swift concert uh, the weekend before and he had had a little bit of struggles with his ex-wife and some uh, scheduling conflicts and began to just sort of open up and talk about some of the pain in his life. And in that moment, friend, I realized, wow, this isn't just, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Or man, I, boy, I hope that that gets resolved. Hey, let's get that account opened up. The Holy Spirit began to work and said, this is your opportunity to step in and share the love and hope of Jesus. And I did. And it was scary. I didn't know how I was going to respond. Of course, I have the privilege. I opened the line and said, hey, do you know what I do for a living? <laughs> you don't have that. But I said, I'm actually a pastor. And boy, I tell you what, though, aside from being a pastor, I just want you to know that Jesus Christ has been my hope. He's the only one that gets me through circumstances like this. And hey, friends, it was strange. It was awkward. Uh, he was kind of set back in his chair. But I got a chance to tell him about Jesus and what he had done in my life. A week or so after that, I actually gotten online and was in the market to buy a trailer for our house to haul junk around and trash and just to have at our home and found one on an online marketplace and I went and met this gentleman and we did the deal and a few days later we went to go get the title transferred over and we're waiting outside to be called in to get everything notarized and just began to talk with him, sort of an awkward, you know, we have to stand there, we don't know each other and just began to talk and he actually mentioned, he said, my wife is actually leaving me in two weeks our divorce will be final. Friends, in that moment, the Spirit spoke to me and said, this is not just a normal encounter. I ordain this. This is your opportunity to share the hope with him. I'm going to tell you again, friends, it was hard. It was awkward. I didn't know this guy. I didn't know how he would react. But I said to him, you know, I'm so sorry to hear about that. But I tell you what, when I've gone through some pretty tragic stuff in my life, do you know the only thing that's gotten me through is my hope in Jesus Christ. And I began to tell him about what Jesus did in my life. Come to find out, he was actually a pastor sort of years and years back and had a bad experience and was just hurt and broken. And God put that together and I was able to pray with him and love on him. And I have his number now and I intend to check in on him from time to time. Obedient perseverance brings about blessing. You may ask, where will that courage come from though? I'm gonna tell you, for me, it came from the Holy Spirit of God and a willingness to say yes. Where will, the, you know, where will the finances come? It'll come from God. Where are these opportunities you talk about come from, Paul? I don't, I don't see those. It'll come from God if you're just willing to listen. God will bless the ministries that he gives and that he begins and are served by obedient, faithful believers. And listen, friends, I have messed up far more than I've ever gotten right. I'm not standing here preaching, telling you those two stories to puff myself up and say I've gotten this figured out. I just told you in the beginning that I oftentimes have turned a blind eye to people's need. But when I'm obedient and I step out on faith, God always blesses that person, perseverance and he blesses my obedience. But did you notice also that the fear was replaced with confidence in this story of how God was moving behind the scenes? With this new convert, I would imagine that between verse 8 and verse 9, things must have gotten pretty bad, right? We have the new convert, and then the next thing we know, Paul's going on trial, and people are getting beat up. The Jews were no doubt furious, and Paul was probably ready to leave the city. And isn't it just like the Lord to come in and calm our fears at the time when we need it the most? He is with us every step of every day. I want to tell you another story about something that happened here at our church that relates to this around fear and having confidence. This past Christmas, we had all of our Christmas Eve services at our Dormont location. We do that across all of our campuses, and um, so we had it here uh, at our Dormont campus. It was just so fun, but something through those services began to stir. I didn't really know what it was, but just an unsettled feeling, and I began to say, okay, God, what is happening? And he began to sort of birth this dream in my heart of wanting to um, 
really go big and the timing was right for our people that called Northway Dormont home to begin to share their faith. So I said, okay, God, what does this mean? And slowly it began to sort of fall into place through some circumstances and events that we, I wanted to lead our church to do something really big on Easter Sunday coming up in a few months. And um, so we began to pray and I began to talk with my local staff team and we formulated the idea to go out and try to rent the largest school auditorium we could in our area and challenge all of our folks there, our brothers and sisters of Christ, to, to do this, what I'm trying to teach today, where I fail often, and go out and share our faith and share hope and try to invite them to come and hear the gospel as we preached. And I got to be honest, I got very anxious and nervous. And we took it to our leadership, and they graciously said we get behind this vision and dream. And so they helped find the resources, and we funded it, and here we go. And it was an enormous amount of work because we personally as a location have never done that before. And we developed this sort of concept or this mantra of own your radius. You've heard me say that a few times in the sermon now. And we had these little cards printed up and we challenged our people week after week after week for months. Who are the people in your radius? Who are your neighbors that you need to invite and you need to share the hope of Jesus with? Who are the people that you work with? Who's in your family? The world's too big for us, but it's not. To, uh, the radius that God has given you isn't too big. And I kept having this number of 1,000 people in my head. Now, mind you, our location on an average Sunday averaged between four and 500 folks in attendance over three services. So this is crazy nuts to have 1,000 people show up to hear the gospel. And I had a crossroads moment that as pastor. Am I going to share this with our folks? And I remembered stories like this of the Apostle Paul and how God was faithful. And so I stepped out. And I'm going to tell you, I was fearful. All these thoughts began to come in my mind, like, what if people don't show up? What if I make this impassioned plea as a pastor and all of my friends go out and ask their neighbors and they get ridiculed? What if nobody comes and it just takes the spirit of the church down? What happens if we spend this money? It wasn't cheap. What if we spend this money? This is where God's people have tithed and given, and it's our responsibility as leaders to use that biblically to, to propagate the gospel around the world. What if I have led an effort to waste God's money? And I started beginning to sort of spiral in my heart. But I prayed, and I sought the Lord, and I rested back in his promises that if he called us to it, that he's going to fulfill it. So we show up after all this preparation for Easter Sunday at this school, and to my dismay, over 1,200 people showed up. And I had the privilege to preach the gospel in that school auditorium. It was a miracle in and of itself. I don't have time to tell you the story, just to even be able to have this service in a local school. But God showed up. At the end, I did an old altar call, if you will. I made people raise their hands, and if you need Jesus, raise your hand. I want to lead you to Christ, and people all over the auditorium raised their hands, and folks came to know Jesus. And it wasn't just about that number that, oh, we had a huge Easter service, but we've been able to develop relationships with those people. We have over a hundred people that we are working with over the last few months, 120-something folks that we've identified and having coffees with and are going to be joining small groups in our Rooted program that maybe you've heard about, we talk about, our Rooted small group experience. We're on pace to have the largest Rooted semester that we've had since we launched Rooted at our church, all because God replaced that fear with confidence in our people, and he did a special thing. Maybe you're ready to quit. Maybe you've been trying. You're like, Paul, I, I hear you, and I appreciate the passion that you're trying to instill in me today. But man, this friend, this coworker, this neighbor, this family member, they're never going to come to know Jesus. Dear friend, keep being obedient. Keep persevering. Keep pressing in. Keep praying, because I promise you, God is at work. Because when you share your faith, God always upholds his kids. He will never let you down. God always comes through in a pinch. I saw in verse 14 a really important word. It says, but when Paul was about to open his mouth. Did you catch that? That word about is so important. God had made a promise in the midst of Paul's distress, and he stuck to it in the end. God made the promise and stuck to it. 
the battle is over and Satan is fighting a lost cause. When the Apostle Paul began to take things into his own human understanding to defend himself, when he was about to speak, God stepped in and used the most unlikely candidate to have this thrown out of court. I read a few years ago some statistics from Barna Research Group that 9 out of 10 Americans cannot ac accurately define the meaning of, quote, the Great Commission. Maybe you're there right now and there's a little bit of shame in your heart and say, I don't know what the Great Commission is. It's the final words Jesus said before ascending into heaven, go ye therefore, and it was the mandate, the commission for us to do what we're talking about today, to live in victory and to share our hope with other people. Seven out of ten adults have no clue what John 3.16 actually means. Barely one-third of all adults know the meaning of the expression, the gospel. Fifty-eight percent of said born-again Christians claim that they have shared their faith with a non-Christian during the past year. Only about half of those born-again Christians feel a sense of responsibility to tell others about their faith. Those are sad statistics. And it has to change. I read a, a story about Dr. Doreen Edwards. He's a surgeon in Aaron, Tennessee. I'm actually originally from Tennessee, so it caught my attention. He tells of a patient of his, a lady named Blanche Bennett. Her alcoholic husband had died. Her two children were giving her all sorts of problems. Finances were tight, and life was really, really hard. She came to see Dr. Edwards with some physical problems. It turned out that she had cancer that was involved in multiple organs and she didn't have much time to live. Her bitterness and anger welled up even more. Dr. Edwards tried to share with her about his hope and tell her about Jesus, but she wouldn't hear anything that he tried to say regarding Jesus. But just in a haste to get out of the office, she did accept the small New Testament that he gave her. Almost as if, just give it to me so I can get out of here. A few weeks later, the doctor learned of the death of Miss Bennett, and her daughter actually called him. The daughter asked doctor, the doctor if he had any more Bibles that they could have because there was none in their home. She went on to say that her mother was a different person in the closing days of her life, and she told him that she had found Jesus through the Bible that the doctor had given her. And listen to what he says that the sister said, quote, would you please send us a Bible so that we can find what mama found in that book? Friends, if we don't say yes, then the lost are not going to hear. I'm just going to tell you, it isn't somebody else's problem. It's not somebody else's job. If I may be so bold, it's, it's not just my job as a pastor. It's not the church's staff's responsibility. Paul did not sit around and wait on answers. He got busy and tried to win souls, even when it made no sense whatsoever. And I find that many of God's children are hiding behind a mountain of excuses, and it's time that we got about the Lord's work. How do you start these conversations? Maybe it's just to get with your neighbor. And as they begin to talk, you see them cutting grass this weekend, and you have your typical monthly little conversation. Maybe instead of it being about sports or some superficial thing, maybe it's like, you know, I haven't, boy, I haven't even asked, how's your boy doing? How are your kids? Hey, I saw such and such the other day that I noticed. What, what's going on with that? And try to take the conversation to a deeper level. Most of the time, they will begin to share on some level, even if it's guarded, maybe a tragedy or some problem that's going on in their life. And here's what you do. You know, I don't want to make this awkward for you, neighbor, but, you know, I, well, I tell you, I, I'm not really a religious person, but I love Jesus, and he's changed my life. Do you mind if I just... I, can I just pray with you about that real quick? Can I just pray for you? And here's the thing. They may say no, and it may get awkward, but you will walk away with confidence, hope, 
and a high that you've never had before because you were obedient. And you may get the opportunity next time. More times than not, I promise you, they will say, well, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And you're able just to introduce Jesus in their life one step at a time. Begin to love them well and just pray for them. You don't have to have these beautiful King James Version words. Just talk to God as you were talking to them and ask for his peace to come into their life. Invite them to church. Man, I don't want to make things awkward for you, but boy, I love our church. And we've got this new series that's kicking off, or we've got this men's breakfast that's happening, or we've got this women's event, or we've got this marriage conference. Well, would you come with me? Maybe we could meet there. We could ride together. Maybe even God will begin to give you the opportunity where you'll actually full-on begin to share what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. It's time that we open our mouths. And we take the mandate of Scripture and the Great Commission to evangelize our friends seriously once again. And I pray that we can find that passion. And I want to pray for you for that right now as we close. Father God, I thank you that you did not leave us here alone. That We have this beautiful thing called the church. And it's imperfect and we make mistakes and we fight and argue sometimes. And, but God, there is no plan B. We are the church. And I pray for myself, and I pray for all the folks that are watching right now that you would inspire in us, God, that you would bring a holy conviction, that we would do more, that we would step out on faith, that we would be obedient, and you would bring about blessings in the efforts to share the hope of your son Jesus with our neighbors and our family and our coworkers and our friends. And God, I'm not going to ask that you take away the anxiety or the fears. Lord, that you would press into those and you would use them to shape us and change us and that all areas of our life as a result would become clearer and clearer because we're obedient with the number one mandate to share the gospel with a lost and dying world. God, we love you and we praise you and it's in Jesus' name, amen.